Hey, hey, hey. I'm going to start this message a little bit different today. It was the year 2007. My wife was pregnant with our third child. This was going to be my boy. I already had two daughters. We had it all planned out. We would have our kids two years apart. This was going to be Michael Joseph McKelvey Jr. Everything seemed to be going well. Uh, we were, we'd been around this block before. We were no strangers to what it was like to have a baby. And going into our second trimester, we went for a standard sonogram to track the progress and the health of the child. And it was during that sonogram that we learned that the baby had not grown, that it was not reaching the markers that it needed to make to be a healthy size by that second trimester, and that there was no heartbeat of the child. There was nothing in my life to this point to prepare me for a moment like this. There was no books that I had read. There had been nothing that I had been through to teach me how to emotionally handle something like this in front of my children who were with us and with my wife. I will never forget and I'll never get past the look on my wife's face when the sonogram technician said, I'm not supposed to tell you this, but there's no heartbeat. I understand for some that a miscarriage is not a big deal. But to me, I had all my chips in that game. I already had the nursery ready, painted blue. The crib was set. This was Michael Joseph McKelvey Jr. This was to be my son. Literally, I was heartbroken. Heartbroken. I turned to different people for help. I don't understand what's happening. What went wrong? Is it me? Did something go wrong with my genetics? Is it my wife's genetics? Well, like, how do I wrap my mind around this? I don't know how to deal with this emotionally. I had written these stories in my mind that, that we were going to hunt together and fish together and none of those things would become a reality. So I turned to some church people for support and counsel. Give me some advice. Help me through this. And some well-intended church people made a statement to me that would change the trajectory of my life for a time. And this is what the person said to me. Several people had mentioned it to me. Well, Mike, maybe it's just not God's will for you to have a son. Maybe it's not God's will for you to have a son. That one statement broke me. Broke me like nothing in my life could break me. Because you just said to me that God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in it was against me. That he did not want the deepest dreams of my life to come true. God was not in agreement with my dreams. God was not in alignment with my plans. God doesn't want me to have a son. So guess what? You can't go against God's will. I'm never going to have a son. I'm never going to have a son. 
And I'd love to tell you, I'd love to stand up here today and tell you that I did what like a really good pastor would do. I would love to stand here and tell you that it made me get into my word and made me study and made me pray more, but I would be a liar because I did not do that. I did not do that. I got very angry, very angry at God. I got very angry at God. Instead of turning to the word, I turned away from God. I turned away from my family emotionally. I disconnected from my family emotionally. And I went down and it took me down a very dark path for a season of my life. Because I had dedicated my life to God. Dedicated my life to the work of the ministry to be a pastor. And now the one person who I could always count on said no to me about one of the deepest dreams of my life. I don't understand you, God. I don't understand you, God. I don't understand your will. What, what do you want from me? Why can't I have a son? I'd love to tell you that I was praying one day, but it was really more of me screaming at God hysterically out of a depth of pain. Maybe you know where I'm coming from today. Maybe there was something that you dreamed of in your life and maybe you worked very, very hard to get to a certain place in your life and it seemed like you lost it. I had this moment with God where we could call it, we could, let's call it prayer since we're all Christians. But I was angry at God and I was screaming at him and just before you think I'm going to hell for doing that, just let me tell you, God's got really big shoulders. He can, he can handle you, you, you yelling at him a little bit. God, God can handle you not understanding some stuff, okay? Just so you know. Before, before we get all like fearful that we've created the unpardonable sin, the Bible says that his ear is never deaf to the cry of the righteous. Like, he gets you. But I'll never forget this moment. I'll never forget this moment for all eternity because it was a moment that changed me. It changed me again. It changed my trajectory again. And I'm not telling you that I've been perfect since this moment, but this changed me. And I heard the Lord say in a way that I've never heard him say before, I have given you the desires of your heart. And when I first heard that, I did not say amen. I said, no, you didn't. And then I heard it again. I have given you the desires of your heart. No, you didn't! Scream, rage, tears like raindrops flooding out of my face, snot coming out my nose. It was beautiful. <laughs> no, you didn't! Who do I leave my stuff to? Who's my successor? Who's my legacy? So I had to go look this verse of the Bible up. I'm not, I'm not that great of a pastor where I have the whole Bible memorized. So I had to go look up what this verse is. And it's in Psalm 37, verse four. And it says this, take delight in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. And I looked it up and it made me even more angry. I have been taking delight in the Lord. I gave you my whole life. I'm in ministry. No, you didn't. Give me the desire of my heart. I'm slow sometimes, so I had to read it over a hundred times. Over a hundred times. And as I began to read it, the scales begin to fall off my spiritual eyes and I began to see. What he's saying here, take delight in the Lord. And the Lord is saying to me, I take delight in you, son. I take delight in you because you're my child. I'm proud of you. I'm for you, not against you. I delight in you because you're my child and I have given you the desires that are in your heart. And in that moment, something changed. I heard the scripture differently. He didn't say that he was going to make all my dreams come true. He said that the desire that was in my heart 
he put it there. I have given you the desire that's in your heart. I put that desire in your heart. That desire to be a father to men, to have sons, not just spiritual sons, but have earthly sons. I put that desire within you. I said, oh my God, wait a second. This is, this is different now. This is different now. Now it sent me down a road to begin to study the will of God. The will of God. If you're in here today or watching online, I'm sure at some point in your walk with the Lord, you've run into a question, am I doing the will of God? Things that may have happened, maybe you have gone through a loss. Maybe you have gone through tragedy. Maybe you have experienced this exact same thing that I'm talking about today. Maybe something in your life has hurt you and caused pain and you ask, God, was that your will? Are you trying to teach me something? Are you trying to bring me through something? Is this one of those things that God is gonna turn around for his good? Is that what this situation is? Maybe you can identify with the same kind of struggle and pain and question that I was asking. God, what, what's your will? What do you want to happen in the world today? Who do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? What do you want me to accomplish before the end of my life? Well, I gotta tell you, I'm not gonna answer any of that today. Because if we did, we'd be here for three and a half weeks doing a Bible study. I can in no way in 23 minutes tell you what the will of God is for your life. But maybe we could understand the definition of the will of God a little bit clearer today. Is that all right? I'd like to study this out today by looking at a scripture in 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. Timothy was written by the Apostle Paul to his spiritual son, Timothy. Timothy was a church planter. He was out getting a church started. He was new to pastoring. And so Paul was kind of coaching him, uh, being, being his overseer, his apostle. And he writes this to Timothy. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who wills or who desires that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Okay, did we get that today? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men, or the will of God is that all are saved and come to the true knowledge of him. That's God's will. So let's look at this verse, break it down for a second. He says, for this is good. For what is good? What's he talking about? The for this is good is in reference to 1 Timothy 2, verse 1 and 2. He's closing out what he had first said. He said, therefore I exalt, first of all, that all supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. So God is saying, I want you praying for everyone, specifically for those who are in leadership, The word leadership there uh, can be translated the word kings. It could be governments. It could be presidents. Okay, I'm not going political today, but uh, pray for all leaders and those who are in authority that we may live quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness. If you do all that, this is good. That's good and acceptable in the sight of God. If you do all that, that's good and acceptable in the sight of God. Because God desires that all men, women, and children be saved. So let's ask this question. Is it literally God's will that everyone be a Christian? Is that literally God's will that all, I mean, just read it. It's not a trick question. Not a trick question. It is God's will that all be saved. To answer that, to that verse is yes. God's literal will is that all be saved. Now, I'm gonna attempt to answer a question today in light of this verse. What do we do when it seems that the will of God is not being done. 
He tells us that this is his will. It is God's will that all be Christians, all get saved. But we understand that not everybody will, don't we? Okay, we understand that. All right. So to, to properly define and search this out, it is God's will that all be saved. We need, to ident- we need to define the word saved, okay? Now today, this verse that we're gonna look at right now needs to be one of those scriptures that you have memorized. There's about five scriptures in the entire Bible that are a must. If you're a Christian, you must, 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 must memorize it. Um, the way I memorize it is I'm 41 years old. I still go old school. Now, for some of you that are real old school, what I'm going to say is new school. <laughs> but I get out an index card. You new schoolers under 40, you got no idea what an index card is because you just take out your phone and make a note. But I still pull out a th- three by five index card and I write it out by hand in my handwriting. And Romans 10, 9, and 10 is one of those verses. If you ever have any hope of telling somebody else about your faith and bringing them to a decision, you need to know this one. And Romans 10, 9, and 10 says this, that if you confess your mouth with the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth, confession is made unto That's how you're saved. This is the formula of salvation. It's a two steps, two part. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. So let's ask the question, will every single person in the world believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord? Not a sure question, no, no. Now, we don't need to get into this today, but after the rapture, after all the believers are called to, to, to heaven, there will be a moment where the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about in this human life, right now, we understand that it is God's will that every single person be saved But we also understand that not every single person will. Now we got a problem. We got a problem. Feel the tension? Right? You, You see it now, right? Logically thinking, we have a problem. It is God's will, but it's not going to be done. What do we think? What do we do? We have to understand this, and this is where I'm not trying to mess up anybody's theology. I'm not trying to mess up anybody's doctrine. I want us to clearly understand Bible teaching, Bible reading, and your relationship with God, okay? When we're looking at scripture and we're seeing things like God desires or it's God's will, we have to understand that there are two senses of God's will. Senses being like smell, taste, touch, senses two types of God's will. The first type is is really all through the Old Testament. There's some of it in the New Testament, but King David talked a lot about it. He would say things like, God, your will is done in heaven and on earth. David would say things like, who can stand in opposition to your will? No one. Who can oppose your will, God? No one. And there's this sense in which we all understand that when God desires to do something and he puts the effort forth to do it, it's going to get done. Let's look at this. God said, let there be light. There was light. God said, let there be trees. There were trees. Huh? He said it. It was his intention for it to be done. It was done. That's God's will. When this occurs, when God says it and it's done, this is called God's sovereign will. God's sovereign will, the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. We need to understand this, and and I do not stand in opposition to this at all. God is omniscient, he's omnipotent. 
He's all knowing. He's in all places at all times. He's all powerful. If God wanted to, he could just say, you're all dead and we're gone. In his infinite sovereign power, God can do whatever he wants to do. Get that? God's sovereign will, there's no question. There's no variation. It is written and done exactly as it was spoken from God. But there's other times in scripture, like the one that we looked at, where it uses the word God's will or God's desire. It is God's desire that all men be saved and it's not always done. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5.18, for example. It says, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God. All right, let me ask you a question. You walk out of your house before, you're, before you gotta go to work, you didn't plan ahead, so you know that it takes exactly seven and a half minutes to get from your house to your job, so you can still clock in on time. You walk outside and you have a flat tire. Is your first reaction, hey, oh, thank you, Jesus. Hey, flat tire, Jesus. Ah. Thank you, Jesus. Huh? Are you like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I'm gonna be late for work. I've already been late. Ah. So God's will is not being done. God's will not being done. Because this says, in everything, give thanks. This is the will of God. All right, gents, let's just talk about this for a second. When you know you told your wife exactly what you wanted for Christmas, you even gave her the model number, You sent her a direct text message to the link on Amazon to get it, but then she don't get you that for Christmas. And you open up what she gave you and it's some bootleg discount. It don't, it, it <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you open it and you're kind of like, ah. Oh. You try to pretend like, oh, thank you. But in the back of your mind, you're like, I sent you the link. <laughs> in that moment of your mind saying, I sent you the link, God's will's not being done. Because you're not giving thanks in every single situation. Listen, I'm not, I'm not discrediting the Bible at all. I'm just trying to be for real. Let's be for real as to why we're aggravated a lot in the Christian life. We got a problem here. Scripture clearly says that it is God's will that you give thanks and that you dance and skip around all the time. And we don't. So let's look at this. In the first instance, God's sovereign will. God says, I want this done and I'm going to do it. God says, I want there to be light, so I'm going to create the sun, and it's done. But there's a second instance where God says, I want this done, and you're supposed to do it. I want thanksgiving in all situations, and you're supposed to do it. God's sovereign will says, I want this done, I'm going to do it. But there's a second will of God that says, I want this done and I'm expecting my children to accomplish the task. The first will of God cannot be prevented, the second will of God can. So, does God want everyone saved according to 1 Timothy 2? Yes, yes, but he doesn't want everyone saved sovereignly or everyone will be saved. 
there's this second will called God's moral will. God's moral will. This is defined in 1 John 2, 17, God's moral will. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, how does that define anything, Pastor Mike? Well, the word whoever. Whoever does. So whoever doesn't means there's a choice. There's a choice between whoever does and whoever doesn't. There's another verse. He says this. I lay before you today a choice. Life or death. Blessings or cursings. The power of choice is in your hands, but I'm going to give you a cheat sheet. He says, choose life. <laughs> choose life. It's easier. It's better. Choose the blessing. Whoever does the will of God abides forever, but man has choice. I got to tell you, sometimes I wish he didn't. Sometimes I wish God Almighty would just open up my brain, drop his will in it, and I was like, yes, Lord. <laughs> because sometimes this brain of mine and the appetites of mine and the behaviors of mine don't align with what God is trying to tell me to do. Two types of God's will, two senses of his will. And I need you to understand today, this in no way weakens the power of scripture. It actually empowers every believer to choose the will of God in their daily lives. So let's talk about you today. If God's desire is that all be saved, then what is your part to play? Ready? Romans 10, 14. It says this, how then shall people call on the name of the Lord if they haven't believed? This is a mathematical equation. How can they believe if they never heard? How can they hear without a preacher? And how can anyone become a preacher if no one trained them, equipped them, and sent them? I'm paraphrasing. Mike McKelvey translation. Sign it. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe on him who they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach unless they're sent? If they're not sent, they don't preach. If they don't preach, people don't hear. If people don't hear, they don't believe. If they don't believe, they can't call. This verse works forward and backwards. I love it. One of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, passages. It works forward and it works backward. And it says this, who's going to go tell someone about Jesus? It is God's will that everybody hears. But how are people going to hear if you don't ever tell somebody? Statistics are this, 90% of Christians never share their faith. They take Christianity as something for theirs to own and hold and obtain, and they never share it with anybody else. This is not my responsibility as a pastor of a church. The word preacher and preach does not mean that you have to be ordained or licensed. This is the design of the church universal that all can be saved when we all decide to share our faith. Mm. God literally desires all of us to do his work in our lives. It is God's moral will that we all share our faith. But you gotta hear this, you gotta hear this. But God will never override his universal law called man's free will. He could. He could do that. He's all powerful. 
God could easily override your will any day and make you do whatever he wants. He could. But he set a law in place. He says, I won't. Although I could, I won't. Because I want you to love me because you choose to love me, not because I made you love me. Man has free will. Every single one of us, we want in our lives true freedom. We want true fulfillment. We want true joy. And that will only come when we align our personal free will with that of the will of God. One of my best friends is a chiropractor. Anytime my back feels kind of out of whack, I go say, hey, bro, you're like, hook me up, fix me up, get me, get me lined up. And, and what, he, what he's basically doing, he's taking a subluxation or, or he's realigning my spine so that the vertebrae and the discs and everything are in alignment. Here's what he taught me. I don't remember if it's trillion, billion, million, but there's like 70 trillion nerves that come out of your brain from the base of your spine that go down your spine and come out of each vertebrae to different organs of your body. Literally, a subluxation or a vertebrae out of alignment can cause heart disease, can cause breathing problems, can cause eating disorders. If, if a nerve is pinched, and it only takes the weight of a dime to create nerve damage, if one of those nerves are pinched, something in your body will not function properly. When you get out of alignment with the will of God, there are areas of your life that will not function properly until you get it realigned. We've got to get aligned with the will of God. So here's the question today, circling back to the beginning of my story. When I lost my child, this is a trick question. When I lost my child, was that God's sovereign will that I would not have a son? Or was that God's moral will that I would not have a son? It's a trick question. So there's a third option. Neither. It was neither. It wasn't God's sovereign will and it wasn't God's moral will because I ended up having a son. So there's this third option. John 10.10. 10. The thief cometh to steal, kill, and destroy. There's an enemy who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There's an enemy loose on our earth today in operation in what's happening in our world today that's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. He's in operation in the way we feel about each other right now politically. Steal, kill, and destroy. And then Jesus says something magical. He says, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Come on, somebody. He says this, it is God's will that you have life and have it more abundantly. God's will is that you have life and have it more abundantly. That's his moral will for your life, that you live a life more abundant. I was not in a fight against God's moral will. I was not in a fight against God's sovereign will. I was actually in a fight with a bunch of Christian idiots who felt like they were giving me some kind of comfort by blaming it on God when God was not involved in the process of stealing, killing, and destroying in my life. This is let me give you some advice. If you ever try to help somebody through a moment of hurt and pain and you don't know what you're talking about, say, I don't know what I'm talking about. But if you need to talk, I'm here. Mm. 
I almost lost my way. I almost lost my way. I almost did it, man. I almost walked away from the pain because it'd be so much easier. It'd been so much easier to just say, I'm done, God. I'm done. But you gotta get this revelation today. If you've been through something that hurts you, you gotta get this today. You were stolen from. You were stolen from. Some of us, we, 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 we've had our joy stolen. Some of us, we, we've had our security stolen. We've had our peace stolen. We've had, we, we've had uh, you know, happiness and, and, and finances stolen. The only way, the Bible says this, whatever's stolen will be repaid. Get in alignment. Get in alignment. I wanna close out by telling you a few things. And I hope you hear this today. And this is not some theological term. This is Mike, this isn't Pastor Mike. This is Mike McKelvey. Straight out telling you this because you gotta get this. God literally loves you. God literally loves you. There is nothing in your story of life that is so bad that God would write you off. He literally loves you. God is literally good all the time. Even when all of hell is coming against you, God is still good. God is literally in a good mood all the time. God is not angry. He put all the wrath against sin on the cross. God is literally for you and stands with you against anything that comes to attack you. There is no evil thoughts in God, there's no angry tones, and there's no emotional deviation in him. God literally wants a relationship with you. He literally wants to cover you and protect you and lead you into a life of victory. If you're hearing me today, if you're hearing me today and you haven't accepted that way yet in your life, if you've never made this commitment to give your life to Christ, like he said, it is God's will that all be saved and you know I, I'm not there. We wanna offer that to you today by your own free will. We wanna do what Romans 10, 9 and 10 says. The first step is in the heart we believe. We believe that God is God, he is Lord, he is eternal, that he died on the cross, he rose from the dead to save me, that God loves me just the way I am. We need to get that. That leads us into righteousness. With the heart, man believes into righteousness. And then with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And we pray a prayer out loud together. This is not to embarrass anybody, but we're just doing what the Bible says. If you're watching online and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we invite you as well to pray this prayer with us and it goes like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.